What's up, everybody? Patrick Connor here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. We've got big fights this weekend. Big fights for, you know, perhaps the right and wrong reasons, but nonetheless, big fights. So I'm here with my dude, Bryn Jonathan Butler, author, filmmaker, and of course, my pal, to talk about these big fights. Bryn, what's up, man? I'm ready for it to be one of 80 million people. More people than elected either candidate to watch Mike Tyson <laughs> and Jake Paul. Whoa. Yikes. You know, it's a, a lot about this uh, Mike Tyson, Jake Paul thing. It's going to piss off a lot of boxing fans. It, it might even piss off some fans of the show and boxing fans who who tune in because they don't think, you know, they hate this and they don't think that it's real boxing and stuff like that. And they're not even wrong. I'm not even arguing with them. Uh, we did talk about Mike Tyson versus Roy Jones, though, and I think for similar reasons. Uh, it's it's an event. Uh, a lot of people are kind of tuning in, and it also does have implications for the sport of boxing and stuff that actually is going on. But also, look, I'm not going to lie here. We're just kind of fucking sickos. I mean, it's it's it, it, it's fascinating to me that celebrity boxing in the '90s. You had Joey Buttafuoco, Tanya Harding. Danny Bonaducci had any anybody they could bring out, Vanilla Ice, guys from the Brady Bunch or whatever. Nobody gave a fucking shit. Fucking Rorschach from fucking Yeah. <laughs> Welcome yeah, back. Yeah, but... oh, fuck. Hey, I mean, you just that was so crazy. Any, but anybody looking to get a little bit of, I mean, I don't even think a payday, but just a little bit of attention, like attention addicts. And nobody cared. It 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 looked like on paper. It was, in what way did it look different on paper then as this does now is strange. Like the time has caught up with it where suddenly this is literally going to, I think has a very good chance of getting as many people watching it as Ali versus Spinks on ABC wide world of sports, which I think got in the neighborhood of 80 million people in a much smaller population of the country. But I think that was the most watched thing in American history in, in 1978 or so. So my thought with this, I mean, we're going to have to kind of parse a few different things. Like I propose that we sort of look at every one of Tyson's losses in his career to get a sense of where is he at now at 58 years old? Buster Douglas in just four months from now happened 35 years ago for Tyson. It's, it's crazy. And he hasn't fought in 19 years since his last lost to a journeyman in Kevin McBride. But but the other thing that he has done is when he fought Roy Jones during COVID, he fought in the most successful pay-per-view. This is not going to be on pay-per-view against Jake Paul. This is Netflix. If you have a subscription, you can, you can tune in. But the most successful pay-per-view in combat sports when he fought Jones. And it clearly appeared to be a work using wrestling language in the sense that it was scripted, that nobody nobody wanted to get the other hurt and nobody complained about it. People were satisfied, unlike a lot of boxing pay-per-views, legitimate boxing pay-per-views. So I, my, I'm putting forward, that was the proof of concept that you could put this forward. There's no barrier to entry economically. As long as you have your Netflix subscription, it's gonna get a shit ton of people watching, probably a bunch of uh, people subscribing and I think if it's scripted, like what would what would we script it to be to satisfy people? Not one of them getting hurt, not Mike Tyson getting knocked out. I don't think Jake Paul wants to get knocked out, even though he lost to Tommy Fury, which obviously delegitimizes anybody saying how good he really could be and could win a, a world championship. But there's a lot to this that is, I think, a bigger deal than just a, a kind of joke or sideshow. In in the mar in the sense of marketing, it is very real, and it's the idea that this could get eighty million people watching it. Think of any other thing that you could put forward on Netflix that would get eighty million people watching the same thing at the same time. It's not going to be Taylor Swift. It's not going to be Beyonce. It's not the Olympics. It's not the Oscars. What is it? I don't know that it's anything other than this, which is so weird. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't even know the numbers as far as like uh, viewership and subscriptions and stuff like that. Although I will say I, I am aware that those are the things that, I mean, just to kind of briefly get into 
uh, what the importance of certain things in boxing are. Like, for instance, in back in the day, and probably all the way, and to a certain degree now, but back in the day, like attendance figures would have been where it was at, right? Like that was how you made your money is how you could get people out to the fucking ballpark or wherever the fuck it was you were holding a fight. And that was where the money was made. And that's where the legal money was made apart from the betting, basically. And then eventually TV, when TV developed, that changed everything because the money started flowing through TV and then eventually started pushing toward advertisers and stuff like that. And that's where it was for a long, long time. And then all of a sudden, the streaming platforms started changing a lot. There's still a lot of money in advertising. But uh, a lot of places have started abandoning like site fees and stuff like that. You're seeing a lot fewer uh, fights being hosted like at casinos and stuff like that. So in any case, long story short, that's why I also think, like you said, this is kind of important in the sense that this is in a lot of ways the potential future of boxing. Uh, just like a few years ago when DAZN showed up and they, in, in their in their own way, I mean, I'm not going to, I fucking hate the platform now at this point. I just can't handle it. I, the production and just about everything about it is not good. But at least when it showed up, the idea that it kind of broke some mold was important. And this similarly, you know, having a fight on Netflix, having a fight that's kind of like a, in a way, almost like a throwback in the sense the the accessibility a throwback to having it on free cable in a sense. This is a, as close to that as it's going to get basically. Yeah. I mean, Netflix has almost 283 million subscribers globally. So what share of them is interested in watching this in real time? And let's remember also, this is really cleverly constructed because it's a hybrid of this sideshow thing with Tyson Paul as the main event but you have an absolutely legitimately amazing fight in Serrano and Taylor, which which all the fights that I've seen covering boxing in like 15 years, that was the best atmosphere I've ever been to for a boxing match at MSG in their first fight. It was amazing, absolutely incredible. And to put that on this fight and the way Jake Paul has marketed himself with his involvement in boxing, advocating for women's boxing – whether it's whether it's cynical, like like to give him a little bit of cover for who he's fighting, such as a 58 year old celebrity, it's a brilliant move. He he's innovating and he's innovating in ways that are grabbing just extraordinary amounts of attention, and he's doing a better job at that than Ivy League people like Bob Arum or or Don King were able to muster. So you have to give him his due that way. You you but, hit the nail on the head there, dude. Yeah. And honestly, uh, I have to say, I do think that that there's, again, probably, look, we don't have a big fucking viewership or listenership. So when I say things like people are going to be mad, when I say people, there's going to be like three people. But nonetheless, you know, pe people might be fucking mad to hear any sort of praise for Jake Paul. And I understand, I understand like the, that kind of cynicism and I understand the resentment. However, I do think that a lot of that resentment seems to be born from the fact that he took a formula that promoters had been telling everybody for decades. It's it's so difficult. You can't manufacture a fighter. You can't it you can't be the only me. I'm 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 the only fucking guy. That's basically the entire fucking shtick, right? Right. And now all of a sudden Jake Paul showed up and did it in short order and said, actually, no, I'm going to do that and did it. So I think that that's, that's a lot of the resentment comes from that angle, in my opinion, but it also is telling it's telling that he's been able to exploit uh, for better and worse. A lot of the things about box and look at that's what Turkey L shakes doing right now. He's exploiting the nature of boxing and how the sport is run and not run to just insert himself seamlessly just with some money. And Jake Paul basically did the exact same thing. Uh, and 
so like and kind of toward the start of when Jake Paul emerged and the whole YouTuber boxing thing, notice people aren't saying that quite as often. You know, they're not complaining about the YouTuber thing, but that YouTuber shit was a big portion of this because a lot of people are not aware of just how much fucking money he made from that platform. Like a lot of money, you guys, way more than any fighters ever see in their lifetime. Like, you know, like Mayweather style money. And he made that from YouTube and basically was able to just say like, all right, I'm going to throw some money at boxing. So again, um, you have to give him his credit for being able to do that because, you know, he he's uh, demonstrating quite a bit. And like you said also about the kind of attaching himself onto the real boxing very clever because he's done that pretty much from the beginning and he's been able to showcase a lot of uh real fighters in he also has a series on DAZN and stuff like that that at, does have actual boxing and a lot of prospects and shit like that which is generally speaking good for the sport and like you said Katie Taylor Amanda Serrano he's also got Shushu Carrington on the card you know Mario Barrios there are real fighters and real fights on this card so that's that's clever on his part and also in in a lot of ways helpful to the sport. I mean to me it's sort of like Jake Paul and what he's doing as a YouTube celebrity uh, provo provocateur it's sort of like spiking the drug that boxing is for its audience with a bit of the celebrity fentanyl. And I think you know who remind me who won the gold medal in the Olympics in like old style wrestling? Like this past year or this past Olympics? Yeah. Can you just remind me? How how about any Olympic gold medalist in wrestling? Can you remind me who that was? Just uh, one of them ever in history? Rulon Gardner. Okay, so you got one. But my point being, <laughs> WWE, a fake sport, is churning over a billion and a half dollars a year. And nobody's complaining about that it's scripted. Nobody gives a shit because they're entertained by it. That is where I think this is headed, is you use boxing, which has this audience of like, oh, yeah, like it, it has this history and and these legendary characters. And it was the biggest sport in America. But at a certain point, if you don't give a shit about what the result is and you can manufacture it and script it and nobody really cares, such as Roy Jones, Mike Tyson. That proof of concept means you can just move over to characters who would be fun to watch and they'll give you not waiting for fight. Oh, Pacquiao and Mayweather was not exciting. I feel so let down. What if you're never let down? You get to have WrestleMania. You get to have scripted by top screenwriters sort of a result that is, is really emotionally satisfying in one direction or another where you need to watch it again and again and again. And we don't have to worry about the random randomness of real boxing, real life, unpredictability, a lot of boring results, a lot of great fights on paper that don't add up. I'm not saying we're headed there, but I'm saying if this thing hits it out of the park, get ready for rematches with Tyson and Lewis, with Holyfield. I mean, I mean, Donald Trump was very shrewd to to be, you know, doing like boss man slams of Vince McMahon in the WWE. Like, I mean, he's doing it in front of a gigantic audience. That audience votes. That audience is paying money and they're thrilled. And Vince McMahon is, is the most interesting character that WWE ever created. I think you could argue. I'm not saying the best, but just the most interesting. Um, I just feel like this is kind of suggesting if a 58-year-old celebrity, who who's also a legendary boxer, but has not been relevant in boxing for... I mean, in the sense of being a competitive, could be heavyweight champion for like 25 years or 20 odd years. Um, boy, this is this could take us some really interesting places that um, is going to, I think, grab more eyeballs with where the culture is than, than what boxing is doing, trying to say, like, how many great stars is boxing churning out? Vince McMahon always said about wrestling, it follows the characters you create. You need to have great characters. Once you've got Hulk Hogan, you know, he becomes bigger than life. I mean, Make-A-Wish Foundation, 
number one celebrity in the world that dying kids wanted to be with was not somebody who really accomplished something in, in I mean, in, in a real way, it was Hulk Hogan to be with them. What Hulk Hogan was accomplishing in a, in a fantasy way was more important than somebody who was accomplishing a real thing. So there's something about that with this Tyson thing, a guy who comes out of prison on a rape conviction, more marketable, making more money to fight Peter McNeely than he did fighting Michael Spinks that tells you a bit about our attraction and fascination with him that still has not subsided. He's about to get the biggest audience he's ever had fighting Jake Paul. Boxing fans have this very self-centric viewpoint. Understandably, I guess, but a lot of boxing fans think that like the hardcore contingent, like that's what brings in the money. That's what's important. No, <laughs> not even close or else they'd be doing what we want. <laughs> they don't give a shit about that. Nah, man, uh, bringing in casual fans and attracting the masses is where the money is at and where it's always been at. It just so happened that in different eras, that seemed to align with the hardcore interests. Now, it barely does. You know, it does sometimes if you're lucky. Um, but like, that's that's not where it's at. And so it it does seem like uh, you know, the potential for bringing in a wider audience really is pretty large. And kind of leaning back toward Tyson in that discussion here so we can talk about his losses, um, Mike Tyson's been able to rehab his image in a tremendous way. And to be clear, I, I am not forgetting or forgiving or anything like that, anything in his past. I'm not interested in whitewashing anything or sanitizing anything. Um, but at the same time, I'm also in a place where I do, you know, recognize and acknowledge that people are complex things and creatures and that, uh, you know, there is a potential for certain people to be rehabbed or to, you know, have wrongs undone or righted or whatever you want to say. And it's not necessarily for me to decide whether or not it's okay for like, for instance, Mike Tyson to enter back into the fucking celebrity mainstream or whatever the case may be. Like I said, it's not for me. It's people have already decided it's fine. It's already happened. They're fine and with mean, it. And my point was, I mean, he's on the record, regardless of his defense of being wrongfully convicted for that sure. rape. He is on record as saying, I didn't do this, but I did do five or six things that are worse than this. What are five or six things that are worse than rape? I'll I leave mean, that there, to you, there aren't least... a whole fucking lot, you know. What I'm saying? Yeah. So like, yeah. So so again, like, put aside, like, table the Desiree Washington thing. He's on record admitting that he was in the right place based on the fact that he got away with five or six things worse than rape. So what I'm saying is, it's interesting. Like you mentioned, rehab his image. That's true but it's also repackaged his image and repackaging his image in this way darker way of ear biting and eating the children of Lennox Lewis and, and so many things he said that were outlandish, turning himself into Scarface, like this bigger than life villain was arguably way more marketable than when he was an absolutely transcendent world-class um, the most potential of any heavyweight in history. And, and that guy just came blazing in at 20 years old. And then the Sphinx thing where a, a lot of the like boxing aficionados picked Sphinx, you know, undefeated guy, two undefeated champions. It was sort of Ali Frazier in a way um, who saw like that he could accomplish that coming 91 seconds and making roughly 10 times the amount of money in one night that Michael Jordan was earning in a year playing basketball at the same time. That's where Mike Tyson was at that time. Like Tyson stood a better chance of becoming 
all of sports first billionaire than than any other athlete before him. Like, like, I mean, I, I mean, ultimately Tiger Woods did it, but Tyson was on his way and, and Tyson was marketing Toyota diet, Pepsi, Mike Tyson's punch out. Like he was Suntory very, dry. Yeah. Very commercially viable in mainstream America, replete with this white savior backstory of custom auto finding the black kid from the ghetto. Like a lot of just fucked up tropes that made everybody attached to this squeaky voice, lisping voice who fights like that. Um, and, uh, you know, two years after Spinks, Douglas comes and he then inhabits the role of the youngest heavyweight champion ever and the biggest upset, upset potentially in the history of sports, not just boxing. So, so fascinating on, on so many different angles. And here we are, I mean, he was almost 24 years old when he lost to Douglas, but we're almost 35 years beyond that. And it's, it's going to get way more attention than Usyk Fury's rematch will way more, um, even potentially with boxing fans, not just casual fans, not just casual non-sports fans, but just celebrity fans, YouTube fans, cultural fans. So I, none of this happens without Tyson. None of this happens without Tyson. Yeah, and I, and I guess to his credit, if you want to call it that, at least in terms of setting a goal and working toward that goal, Jake Jake Paul has called out that he has wanted this fight for several years. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, myself included, I'm sure, probably were dismissing the idea and going, what? Tyson, what? Yeah. Well, look but at I us now. You know, look at us now. Um, so yeah, I, think, I mean, I guess I give him credit for being persistent. I just think like essentially what this has become is Harrison Ford going back to play Indiana Jones, <laughs> you know, like if, if it's a scripted thing, you know, the most likely outcome if they were actually fighting is probably not Jake Paul knocking out Tyson, but it's Tyson dying of a pulmonary embolism or, or you know, brain aneurysm anaphylactic shock from like any number of things that are just just what happened to a 58 year old man competing against a 27 year old with it's a, a charlie ball. horse walking yeah. into the ring <laughs> right right i mean it, it, it's uh you know he had what was it um not a yeah it was a hernia right um no not a hernia it was what's the other one the other common stomach issue on a plane right he had a yeah, medical he had some sort of ulcer Ulcer, I'm sorry, that's exactly what it was. So, you know, not uncommon for a 58-year-old man who's had numerous injuries, numerous surgeries. Um, and I mean, the other thing I wanted to say is of all of these clips, you tell me, I have not seen any of his training where he's hitting the pads or doing sparring where you see more than five or six seconds before they cut. And usually it's two seconds and then they cut to something else. Because when I watch him walk, he doesn't, walk very comfortably he walks very heavily i mean i think he's had knee operations plural but again like he's going to get in the ring against the 27 year old guy who hits pretty hard who's now weighing in around 223 pounds if you can't move that's a pretty bad dangerous situation if it's not scripted i know they're saying officially it's a real fight but does anybody want to see tyson unable to move just get wailed on by a young guy who can stay away or pounce on somebody out of breath i don't know yeah i don't know man i mean the only the only fucking uh possibility i'm seeing here with that is that uh tyson's got himself a blood boy like that fucking ghoulish guy who's doing the blood transfusions to keep himself young but still looks like he's fucking 48 <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know how Tyson does that. I mean, uh, I and I know you probably know even better than I do because you were with Roy Jones, and this even was like ten fucking years ago now that Roy could barely walk. Like I and I've seen him like walk even just like on the red carpet and shit like that, dude. He's like hobbling along. He could barely shuffle oh, his about. Knees are shot. His knees are shot. Totally. He, yeah, he didn't totally. look good against Tyson either. And and that was one of the big reasons why it was so clear that you know, I mean. 
he could barely move and all Tyson had to do was really just get a hold of him. And it was like, you know, in real life, it would have been over. So it was pretty clear that, that that was not on the fucking up and up. But like you said, it was also during a time when that would, that would do just fine. That was, that was all we needed that entire night. Oscar acting like a fucking insane, intoxicated idiot that, I mean, it was crazy. They're smoking weed and, the the ring announcer guy, the Flores guy, fucking go, oh motherfucker, like calling on the fucking commentating. It was that was such a wild, stupid ride. It worked. That was, but now we're older. We're different people now. We've we've learned. We, we've grown. We've changed. I don't know if that shit'll do, but yeah, and, and, I don't know. And I, just, and I just say, like, I'm sure you've heard this too. Like Oscar and Eddie Hearn are floating them having a fight. And I mean, mm-hmm. Eddie Hearn is like six foot five and a huge guy. Oscar clearly is juiced to the gills with some of these weird photos of him, you know, where yeah, yeah, he's, he's got like ab implants and shit. Yeah, dude. he looks like and Sean on, Penn. And then on top of that is on so he's on more fucking drugs than an embalmed fucking corpse, bro. But but like who what kind of audience would Eddie Hearn and Oscar de la Hoya generate? <laughs> Probably a big audience. Well, maybe. I mean, maybe some people in boxing, like it would be fun to see, uh, you know, somebody, a power broker in boxing fight an ex-fighter. But but no casual fans would tune into that. No casual fans have any idea who Eddie Hearn is. Well, actually, some British, if there are any casual fans, they're going to be British fans. Because yeah, yeah, American yeah. fans are going to be like, Eddie who? Yeah. I don't think Americans outside of the boxing world have any idea. And who most of them is. probably already know Oscars fucking twacky yeah i mean even even oscar it's interesting for a guy who's winning latin grammys and had a lot of name recognition as kind of a sex symbol for women and stuff i mean like when he was you know winning yeah, the yeah. Gold Medal and his mom's story and stuff like that but how quickly after he left the sport after pacquiao that he became really parochial like boxing people of course know him he had a great career but outside of boxing, I don't really ever hear him mentioned unless there's a weird scandal. I mean, even the cross-dressing thing, that didn't even really permeate beyond boxing or sports. Nobody really cared. Nah. Nah, and nobody been... really cares about him like that either. You know what I'm saying? Like, no. in general, like, nobody really, no. He's not a celebrity like that. Um, but, yeah, I would say certainly in his day and especially within the sport of boxing, I mean – with at the risk of sounding like a fucking dickhead here when you knew that when you went to an Oscar de la Hoya fight in Vegas the amount of beautiful women who turned out for his fights was it was unlike any anyone else anyone else I don't know why I like I mean I kind of know on why but like I don't know the scientific fucking reasons why but honestly well, and, and the other thing about him was, I, I believe this is an accurate statistic, um, in his heyday, 70% of all pay-per-views were bought by women, like, which is astronomical. I think it's, yeah, I think it said that on that, on that, the the documentary thing that we watched, remember, the when we talked about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, it yeah, said yeah. that, yeah, which is so, crazy. I mean, which is just like a crossover appeal that is totally unprecedented in the history of boxing. I don't think anybody would be remotely close to that with with boxing or ultimate fighting like that is astounding but but our point just being how quickly people fade after they you know the the bloom is off the rose when they they lose and start losing and then after the pacquiao thing where it's like you give up on your stool pretty quickly he goes into sort of obscurity outside of boxing tyson Tyson, it seemed like that that's happened kind of at times, and then he weaves back in for some reason or other. He, I can remember Jeremy Schapp did a thing, a documentary E60 or something, and said it was like the sports Emmys, and there were all of these top people in sports. This is probably like five, ten years after Tyson retired. And even Shaquille O'Neal walked into a room where Tyson was, and Schapp was like, it's still Tyson's room. It just doesn't change. Like he's still the one that everybody's like, oh my God, Mike Tyson's there. I don't know what it is about him that has maintained that. Very, very, very few people are able to maintain that mystique and keep us interested, let alone keep us paying for shit. 
<laughs> but um, he's still there. I mean, with this thing that I don't see how it could possibly be real. I just don't, I don't know how anybody associated with him could allow him to potentially be knocked out cold at 58 years old. Your brain gets more susceptible to damage the older you get. And, and you're more prone to concussions. You're mo more prone to damage. So I, I, I just don't see a world in which this could be a legitimate fight where he could get seriously hurt. One to kind of piggyback off that and also swing back to his losses. Yeah. He took damage during the Holyfield fights, especially the first one. I don't know that he took a ton of damage in the second one, but we, we talked about that on a separate podcast, you and I, where we did a, yeah. we went over and kind of rescored him and stuff like that. And I think that the takeaway for me anyway for a lot of those rounds was that many of the rounds were a lot closer than I remembered and that Holyfield was not quite as successful as I think that a lot of people kind of tend to generally say like, Oh, Holyfield kicked his ass or Holyfield owned him and stuff like that. And like, yeah, there were definitely some rounds where that happened, but there were some also, also some rounds where Mike fought back a lot more than I remembered. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, like uh, that was better than I thought. But that being said, like you were just kind of saying, you know, he he did take a, a substantial amount of damage uh, during especially the first fight and in the last few rounds where he kind of got beaten up and then he kind of just got, you know, sat down. Like, you know, that was just kind of a beat down in the last few rounds of the first fight. And on top of that, also going back to what you were saying earlier about his popularity and his popularity eclipsing his earlier popularity when he had come back. And that was also why that first Holyfield fight was such a big upset when, you know, in retrospect, people are like, oh, no, of course, you know, of course, Holyfield was always going to beat him. And it was like, that's not what motherfuckers were saying at the time. And no, on top of that, oh, it was, it, yeah, the odds were serious. And we also recently went over why that was too. You know, Holyfield didn't look very good against our boy, Bobby Chez, for instance. And yep. Going, uh, I you might have seen because I posted on social media. I know Eris has, but like I've you know been collecting a, an absurd amount of boxing magazines lately, and some of them from the 90s are literally both KO Ring and a couple of others are literally having like every fucking issue is almost this weird meta self analysis of are we covering Mike Tyson too much? Yes but we're still going to keep doing it. It's like, Jesus Christ, you guys. And this is, you know, part of the heyday of the boxing magazines These people are, you know, jerking off about. It's a fucking shameful idiocy. But in that being said, it's crazy how fucking uh, popular he was and how much they were covering him. You know, it, it really is crazy. Um, but yeah, back to, again, the damage. Well, and, and I would just say, I mean, 35 years ago, Buster Douglas beat him bad. He was getting, he got knocked down in sparring at oh, least yeah, once. Oh, yeah, swollen. Um, but Douglas beat the hell out of him. I mean, it, it it was brutal. And and I think he took a beating. I mean, anybody who says Tyson didn't have a chin, like he took a pounding in that fight. I mean, 10 rounds and landed, I wouldn't say a lucky knockdown, the controversial long count which I, I do not feel it was controversial um, any more than like when Tyson gets knocked out himself, it's kind of a long count. Like it's consistent. We've, we've mentioned this before that a referee's count is not just 10 seconds. It's a 10 count. Yeah. It's idiosyncratic to a degree. Like there's nothing suspicious. It's, about it's it. also putting it like in a weird vacuum. You know what I'm saying? Like one knockdown, the dude, the dude got knocked down. And the entire time the referee can see his eyes and can see that, like, you know, he's generally okay. Like, he, you can see even, I'm not trying to make excuses, but Buster Douglas is kind of like, you know, he's lucid. On the other hand, Mike Tyson is, like, fumbling for his mouthpiece, kind oh, of like, you know, not. trying to get a, it's two totally separate situations. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So to yeah. act like it's apples and apples is not, that's not like a genuine, you know? No, I mean, Douglas gets knocked down by a, a brutal uppercut. Tyson reaches for one home run shot, and you can see Douglas smack. Yeah, he's more like mad. He's like, away. damn. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, there are controversial things. I was annoyed. I, I interviewed Usyk a little while ago, like a couple weeks ago, and 
I thought that when he knocked down Fury the first time in their fight, that Fury, you could have had five knockdowns scored against him before the ref jumped in and protect him from really getting knocked out cold, I think. And that was I a lot of people forgot about like that that was the ref totally fucked that fucking situation and that Usyk might have opinion, been able to finish it. In my opinion, I mean there were five times where the ropes clearly kept Fury up. Yeah, five that was times not a... where the referee should have counted a knockdown, or if you're not gonna do it, you let it the sequence be finished. Exactly. The then if you're not gonna, then let that shit play out. Yeah, you know. So like, there's no consistency. And that's that's what we're asking. Every referee has sort of a different structure of how they view it. This was inconsistent. I don't know why. I'm not saying it was some corrupt thing, but it was it was shitty. It was something that should have been flagged. So with I don't see any of that with the Douglas fight. I think it was fair and square. It's funny too because the shot that Tyson knocks Douglas down with, I think, was a way more severe shot than the one that Holyfield ultimately knocked him out with. Where it's, I mean, it's it's a counter right, but there's not a ton on it. I mean, it's really an arm shot, and Douglas just stays down. I mean, Douglas went back to being the Douglas he'd been before, and the Douglas he would be after. Um, but but the amount of damage that Tyson took in that fight was also emblematic of he's going to start struggling a bit. He's not going to be the guy where it's novel to see him get hit by opponents. After Douglas, he goes on. He fights Henry Tillman, knocks him out avenges the amateur stuff but the fights against ruddick both of them he took some huge shots and i i think i remember as a teenager i think he said that ruddick was the hardest hitter he ever faced as a puncher and ruddick hit him with some massive shots this is different kind of tyson not as defensively responsible not as elusive he doesn't look in the same kind of condition that he used to physically but i think he took a lot of damage there and that was setting up the first fight with Holyfield, which I want to ask you, if that fight had happened after the second Ruddick fight, is it any different or how is it different if he fought Holyfield then? Uh, I mean, I think it seemed to me like he was a little bit more confident of his own abilities at that point than later on in his career to me. And yeah. I think that he even said that whether or not he's being, you know, totally forthright i have no idea you know he could just be saying that as part of his own fucking repackaging and marketing shit right now where yep. he's like you know mr fucking humble and shit although yep. to be to be fair even back in the day he did he was humble in some ways like you know he would definitely recognize fighters of yesteryear as you know shit like that but that being said um you know he he has said that on his second leg of his career or whatever that pretty much everything that he was saying and doing was just a, to fucking make up for how scared and that he was even more scared then than he was earlier in his career because he had kind of just like he it, that earlier in his career it was more of a fear of like he needed to get the first failure out or whatever but then after he did and after the Buster Douglas fight and before he got released from prison that he was like he like he felt okay like against Ruddock and shit like that, and I mean I think that you could kind of see that in those fights even against uh, Bust or uh, Razor Ruddock, where you can like see that he's like he's fighting hard and that there are also uh, a number of sequences where he's like he's not just giving in like he kind of did in some other fights and he's not just kind of giving into like clinches and shit like that he's actually yeah. fighting like doing some infighting, but. So, yeah, I think that there's a good chance that it would have looked different had he fought Holyfield at that time. But at the same time, even though it's kind of trite, even though it's kind of cliche to say, oh, he's a bully. Anytime somebody pushes back, he's going to give in. I do think that there is some truth to that, honestly. Um, like, I don't think that it's fully truthful, but I do think there is some truth to that. And that Holyfield's style that kind of style where he's a uh, an aggressive counterpuncher is generally speaking a bad style for Tyson. I agree with that. I mean, I think anybody who stood up to Tyson and fought to win, if you back Tyson up, he started losing. I can't think of anybody where he was backed up where he didn't lose. Uh, but on the other side with Holyfield is after Holyfield beats Douglas, I think he had Foreman. And then I think when he fought, was Burke Cooper next? 
but at least Bert, sequentially yeah yeah or we're pretty close to that era like Bert cooper came really close to knocking out holyfield yeah yeah it was foreman then cooper then holmes okay so cooper cooper is a little different than tyson i i think people go oh they're both 511 and cooper clearly like the black trunks and sort of seemed to model his iconography on tyson a little bit um, but he's a different kind of puncher than Tyson. He's not elusive. He got the the arm thing, but he's he's got a lot more reach than Tyson. He His he counter... trained with Frazier. Yeah, right, that, right, right. That's right. where he yeah. got that style. Yeah, absolutely. But he he was a huge puncher. I mean, there's some he has some really exciting fights with like Michael Moore and stuff like that. O often it doesn't turn out too well for for Mr. Cooper, but he's very exciting. Uh, it gives a bit of a blueprint for what Tyson might have done with countering when he was younger. I mean, Tyson would have been 25 when he fought Holyfield. After his second Ruddick fight, he was at the end of being 24. So likely he would have been 25 when they fought. But he was no longer seriously training in, in generally in good condition. Uh, he was also struggling about weight ballooning in between fights look at some pictures of him going to jail when he's 25 he's big he's like 260 270 he looks very very large in a suit and comes out of jail the most ripped he ever looked but um but doesn't seem to have the timing doesn't look good against mcneely it's all image at that point um i think when you go back and watch those fights i mean if you were alive as they were happening Tyson and everybody associated with him, Don King's like, he's better than ever. He's totally back on track. But now we know he wasn't. He he could get into shape, but he's even admitted in various documentaries, like, I still had fast hands and I could punch, but I knew I wasn't the same guy that I was in that early run. So it's not us interpreting that. He's conceded that. Yep. And and you could see you can see it in, in the yeah. fights. You can see that after a few rounds. He's just totally acquiescing to the clinches. Like he's not yeah. earlier in his career, the head movement, the the waist movement, like, a, you know, the movement at the waist, totally it's gone because he would use those to get away from the clinches or to work in the clinch. And now he just kind of does the, the arms like this, put your gloves on their biceps type shit. Yep. It's like, yeah, okay. He's he's not willing to work anymore. The foot, the foot movement, which was extraordinary, like, Lomachenko, except the 218 pound guy doing a lot of the same moves, the, the shifting, um, the pivoting. Oh, creating... I thought Lomachenko invented those. Yeah. <laughs> well, go back and watch the, like the training videos of Tyson. His footwork is so extraordinary for any size, but I mean, he, he practically makes these moves faster than Lomachenko. Who's like doing it at 126 pounds and Tyson's 220. I mean, it's amazing. Um, but that's all gone. When he comes out of jail, you don't really see any of those great moves, any of the great defensive moves or making somebody miss in really like unprecedented ways for a heavyweight and then countering on either side. Totally ambidextrous, can shift into whatever stance he wants for maximum leverage. Um, that stuff, that stuff's gone. He's he is a small heavyweight who is strong with fast hands, but he's no longer a defensive wizard like he was. Or a pressure counter puncher. He's now uh, a, a boxer puncher who's not that elusive and has always struggled with tall guys who can jab. And he begins to start fighting them. Uh, so after after the Holyfield fights, and I, I agree with you, the first fight, he he takes a lot of shots. And similar to, to Burt Cooper, one of the things that's so insidious about Holyfield is he just doesn't have the knockout power to knock you out so much with one shot. The accumulation, like he lands such a high percentage and with so much volume shots on Tyson cleanly that it, it's a tough fight to watch the first one. I agree with you that he's not totally dominating it, but Tyson takes a lot of punishment, a lot. And in the yeah. second one, I think it was headed the same place before the famous ear biting he uh really starts to slide even more i think i thought he looked like shit against both uh botha fights orlin no norris which is you know he's just trying to fight anybody to get pretty substantial paychecks the Lou savarese fight was a joke the galata fight was sideshow weirdness 
He goes over to Denmark to fight fight Brian Nielsen in the tune-up to Lennox Lewis. And the Lewis fight is just an embarrassment. I mean, he he is a very, very old, I mean, he's just about to turn 36, but he he has nothing left. And uh, before I give it to you, like I remember asking Ronnie Shields the first time I met Shields because he was training Guillermo. Like, where was Tyson at when you were training him for that fight? And he's just like, it was just a paycheck. He he was going through the moment. He did not care. He he knew he could take a beating and make $25, $30 million. That's all he was doing. But we had no hope in hell that he could be competitive in that. And he looked it. He, I just rewatched it the other day, and, and he looks terrible. Not that I think he ever necessarily would have beat Lewis, but that version of him, I don't know how he convinced the public that it would be a meaningful contest. Every single so after coming back from being suspended from the Holyfield rematch, like every single fight, there was like something. Yeah, Franz Botha, he tried to fucking he tried to uh, ap apart from trying to break his arm in the clinch, he yeah. was you know like uh, pushing his head, like acting like he was gonna lace him and shit like that. Or Norris, he hits him after the bell. Julius Francis, that was just a kind of a fucking weird farce that happened in Manchester. Uh, Savarese, he goes after, uh, you know, hits the referee as he's going after Savarese when the fight's fucking stopped. Galata, you know, he throws a fit and fucking goes into a rage when the fight stopped and Galata fucking quits. Turns out Galata has a broken vertebrae. Jesus Christ, leave the guy alone. Uh, you know, and then, you know, he also uh, didn't fight for a year after that because uh, he got suspended because he tested positive for weed. Who cares? It's just weed. Brian Nielsen. That was just weird because a lot of people were like, Brian Nielsen, he's 62 and one, but I've literally never heard of him. What the fuck? <laughs> so that was crazy. And then on top of and that, he looks like butterbean and he looks like a Danish butterbean. Like, I mean, it was like. Where comes does that out to come from? the life of Brian song? They did the walkout. <laughs> that was fucking hilarious and crazy. But th and then on top of that, it's in Denmark. There was just some weird thing with every single Mike Tyson fight. You know, uh, that was just his his signature was just some weird shit. Gets beaten up against Lewis. That was like some of the easiest money that people ever made. Was all of the rubes who thought Mike Tyson was going to come back and do anything against Lennox Lewis, uh, and then. Even the Clifford Etienne fight, dude. Clifford Etienne eats, albeit a solid shot, but then like gets down on the ground and pulls his own mouthpiece out. <laughs> yeah. You can't write it better. You know, you just can't fucking write it better. And then gets beaten to shit against Danny Williams. I mean, yeah. I'll give Danny Williams this. Many other fighters would have just gotten knocked out you know like at least on that caliber or whatever not like top heavyweights yeah but danny williams that was like really his only thing was that he could like get his ass kicked and occasionally come back to win from that that was basically his only thing well because danny williams also in that fight he tyson rocked him at the beginning of it yeah and, and i mean clearly they were doing everything they possibly could to put opponents in front of tyson who are just available to be teed off on because still at this time when Tyson is nearing 40 years old and clearly cannot maintain even remotely the illusion that he's competitive as an elite heavyweight any longer, he's still like looming as somebody signing deals with major networks for like $50 million. Like they're doing everything they can because his audience is still there. He's still the most marketable guy that that's kind of going relative to his ability anyway his celebrity power is transcends the sport but danny williams was there to just be knocked out very very quickly tyson almost does it in the first round lands some big shots but he's got no stamina he's he's at best a two-round fighter and i think by that point danny williams had lost a lot of fight i mean danny Danny Williams is really a cautionary tale now. If you look him up. I, I, yeah, unfortunately, he's still fighting. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, you're right. He's still. But, I mean, I think he's been knocked out. He'd only lost a few fights to that point. 
But yeah. one of the things that they had didn't pay attention to was a couple years before that he fought a dude named Mark Potter, you know, regional level fight, but had his right shoulder totally dislocated and fought the fight like set last several rounds with one arm and wound up getting the knockout with one arm. And that was like the big, you know, it, it, admittedly crazy win, inspirational, et cetera. But, you know, I guess, well, let's put it this way. Would Mike Tyson go on to win a fight with one arm against anybody? No. Maybe not. No, and the loss that Danny Williams took to Vitaly Klitschko after beating Tyson, I don't know how much money he got, but he did not get enough because I remember watching that, and my God, that was like watching somebody get executed. Yeah, that was a just a short, quick, brutal beating. Yeah, so... After that, they bring in Kevin McBride, which is the last professional fight. I don't know how they've had this fight sanctioned. How did a 58-year-old guy get sanctioned to, to fight Jake Paul in this upcoming fight? But apparently it is an official fight, even though that doesn't make any sense. It's a two-minute, or two-minute rounds. I think it's eight two-minute rounds. But Kevin McBride coming into that fight 19 years ago, uh, I mean, he'd been he'd been knocked out three, four. I mean, his first fight was a draw. He'd been knocked out four times, like <laughs> Luis Monaco. I remember that guy, Axel Schultz, Devaro Williamson. I mean, he was just there to be teed off on. I mean, he was at best a journeyman at that point. I, I, I don't mean to demean him, but he was not a top 30 heavyweight. I would be shocked if he was. And he's another one who's been, you know, punching bag for a handful of guys, including Galata and and some others. I think he's been pretty, I, I think he's one of these guys that has pretty serious ill effects to the brain as a result of his boxing career. Um, but Tyson was clearly set up there to uh, get a highlight reel knockout against a big, huge heavyweight. And, um, line him up for, I think it was like a $50 million contract if he beat him. Um, and I'm sure they just would have set it up as close as they possibly could, a series of stiffs to get him some kind of title shot for a, a, a massive pay payday. It's one of the, one of the really freakish things that happens. I was curious when I watched the Lewis fight over is as soon as Lewis dominated him to such an extent that I don't think anybody in the world would have said, eh, if Tyson trained properly, he could, he could win in a rematch. I think he's got a, if he'd made this adjustment, I think he could have Lewis's number. Like, I don't think anybody in the world thought that for two seconds watching that fight, except Mike Tyson at the end of it said, please give me a, thank you for giving me this fight. Please give me a rematch. I really believe I can beat you in a rematch. I needed two tune-up fights to take this fight. I didn't have that. That's kind of the reason I lost. Do you think there's a way in hell that Tyson believed that? Or is it just that he was at that point so in debt? I mean, he's on the way to going bankrupt after earning four or five hundred million dollars in his career and advertisements and stuff. Do you really believe that he's so delusional that he thought he could come back in a rematch and get the better of Lewis after that performance? No. 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 No, because especially because, uh, you know, finally after, after losing to Kevin McBride, and I mean, like, like, I'm not saying that Mike Tyson's the smartest dude on the planet, but he's also, he's not as dumb is like you know like the voice and the lisp and shit you know i know it's funny to make fun of and you know i got gotcha. you he's been hitting the head plenty and I, and obviously he's said and endorsed a lot of stupid things and people so i'm not gonna play like he's you know fucking einstein here but also there's a difference between book smart and street smarts and i think that he does have enough street smarts to know that he loses to kevin mcbride and when he loses to Kevin McBride, he's basically like, bro, you know, this guy I would have pushed out of line to get lunch when I was fucking 16, like, and just tripped him outside of class and pushed him down a hill. Like, and now this guy's knocking me the fuck out. Like, 
time to go. And he said pretty much as much right afterwards. He was just like, man, I'm disrespecting the sport doing this. Like I need to get the fuck out to his credit. You know, he did. And he kind of rearranged himself and repackaged himself, repromoted himself, et cetera. And, you know, perhaps he really did do some true soul searching, but at the very least that I think was an indicator enough and that was just a few years afterwards. So I don't think there's really any, I don't think Lennox was, Lennox was not in the mood, you know, he was not that generous. He was not going to be giving Mike Tyson a fucking rematch, regardless of how much money. Cause you know, he, he wasn't interested in that. I think that he basically just wanted to tie up a loose end. You know, he wanted to make some money tying up a loose end. He never got that fight when he was younger and wanted to get it. And, you know, so I don't really think that Mike, believed that <laughs> no and and i think the other thing is i mean he he was about 39 years old at that point he was an old 39 you know like they said it about joe he's Frazier. lived a life he, yeah he, he lived a life he abused himself drank drugged huge weight yo-yo i mean i mean when he really ballooned to i think like 350 pounds or something i mean he was huge for he was a while. big dude um and then whatever lost premiere people. movie that was that he was at and that fool was like posing with a bunch of celebrities. I remember being like, holy shit, he's large. Um, yeah, he was he was really big because I first got to him for an interview, I think, in 20, 2010. And I was assuming that that was the version of him that I would see at his house. And he had lost like 80 pounds from that. I was like, whoa, he is just transformed. He's back to looking you know, like that jungle cat with such angular features on his face. And um, when he came down the stairs of his house, I was kind of like, wow, like it, it's not that guy. I wonder why he's getting in shape again. Like, like, is he thinking about coming back or something? I don't know. I mean, he only would have been Jesus 44 at that point. Funny, like my age now, but he, he had totally transformed, but there was a sense that, like a lot of athletes, I mean, you see Michael Jordan walking around now who's 60, but Jordan's got a gut. He can't walk properly. Like he's sort of almost limping. Um, I mean, these guys are running so much on these joints and knees. And, um, you know, Tyson had a lot of crippling injuries throughout his career. Like he's had neck operations. I think, I think he said back operations, knee operations. You know, like if you're 220 pounds and you're running four or five miles a day every day on pavement, and he's been doing it since he was 13 years old, like that's what happened to Roy Jones Jr. J J Jones didn't have some injury where he fell off a tractor or something. Like he was just like just running seven miles a day. My dad forced me. If I didn't beat everybody I was running against, he beat me with farm equipment. That's what he said. So like he was he was really damaged with the wear and tear kind of thing that you've only got so many left hooks in the ligaments in your shoulder. It doesn't really matter what you do. I mean, you get an operation or whatever. So that's what I don't understand with Tyson. And I feel nervous, even if it is a fixed scripted thing, a 58 year old guy. It's even, yeah, it's shit could still go down. Even if it's fucking sparring or whatever, you know? I remember like my first trainer, a guy named Ronnie Wilson was 40. Like, he decided he was, a, he was the number one ranked light heavyweight, I think in 1967. And he, he trained in San Diego, your, your neck of the woods. He was from Vancouver, but he, he went down there and he tried to get back into boxing when he was like 49, 50. And I sparred with him at that time because we were both light heavyweights. And I remember just being like, this guy is 49 years old. What is he doing? And he could still move around. He'd never gone up in weight or anything like that. But it was, he was old. He was just old. And the, I, I mean, 40, 48 to 58, man, that's a cliff. Man, that's a cliff. And the bigger you are, I mean, it's just like, you know, as a veterinary technician, bigger the dog, the shorter the life. Well, and it's the same with people as a general that's it. rule. That's too. it. It's There's not it's, a lot of fat it's the old exact people. same thing. And I mean, like your, your heart has to work harder. Your other organs have to work harder. 
uh, they wear out quicker, your joints wear out quicker, et cetera. And, and on top of that, you know, it's going to be even worse when it's more weight on a smaller frame. Mike Tyson is dude, you know, and I've, I've not hung out with him a lot or something like that, but I've met him twice and both times it's like, at least in terms of like, he's bigger than me. Don't get me wrong. I'm not like, you know, like I'm the size of Mike Tyson. I'm not the fucking, but in terms of height and frame, we're not that far apart. And like, I'm 42 and could barely fucking walk, bro. Yeah. You know, it's like, this is fucking rough. I can't even imagine this dude is, you know, running miles and miles and miles and uh, the type of work he was putting into the gym. That's a lot of wear and tear on his body. He's older than I am by quite a bit. He's been probably a lot harsher on his body than I have, which is saying a lot. And, you know, f- say whatever you want about Jake Paul. He's substantially younger. Um, and as I kind of said earlier, Jake Paul, again, say whatever the fuck you want about him. And I'm not looking to defend him, especially not on a personal level. But, you know, it's not easy to get anywhere in boxing. And it's not easy to get anywhere in boxing, even when you start doing it as a kid, much less when you start as an adult. And granted, he's had a leg up in terms of finances because not everybody can just stop their life, right? Not everybody can just say, I'm not going to fucking work in an office anymore. In fact, all of the money I have now is going to be dedicated to the best fucking trainers money can buy, the best equipment. I'm going to build myself a gym, fly in fucking sparring partners from all over the world whenever the fuck I want, do whatever the fuck I want, eat whatever, you know, that type of shit. Nobody can do that, but he can, he did. And that being said, he's put in a lot of work and he's come a long way. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that make me nervous for a old Mike Tyson, uh, regardless of that kind of gulf in talent and the gulf in accomplishments in the boxing world, which is large, but Mike's old. Even actors coming, like I mentioned, like jokingly, Harrison Ford coming back to play Indiana Jones at 80 years old, even that looks precarious. You're like, you just shouldn't be doing this anymore. This is an action hero. The special effects, it still looks cumbersome. And, and then awkward. they wind up making, that's like part of the fucking script. Cause yeah, it's like, it, they can't avoid it. So that they're like, Oh, let's constantly refer to the fact that he's old. And that's funny. It's like, and it's, and it's kind of not, it's like, you just don't have anything else going on that can compete with the nostalgia factor. And, and there's a component of this that is a bit of that, that like if you were around when Tyson was relevant and was on his way up, I mean, I, I was thinking about it the other day, it's like it's a weird era, the 1980s that he came up in because there's so much hype and it's like the last vestige of monoculture. We're all watching the same thing at the same time. If you want to tune in for that show or that sporting event, you well sp- sports are the one thing that you still need to watch it in real time because it's it only happens live once but i mean like movies tv shows special events like that um now we're so fragmented but at that time you had like you know a michael jordan nba final or a michael jackson doing the moonwalk or or eddie murphy doing a comedy special or mike tyson fighting sphinx Um, There was this sense with Tyson, like there was with Michael Jackson after Thriller or Eddie Murphy after a comedy special or on SNL. Wow, we're at the ground floor of a career that could be better than anybody who did this before. And that was really exciting. Like there was a sense with Tyson where like even when Ali would show up to those fights, even when Ali went to like Tyson Holmes and said, like, get him for me sort of thing, you were like, he could be better than Ali. Like Ali didn't look this dominant, right? Like he just, he just didn't. And I'm not taking anything away from Ali. I love Ali, but Tyson represented something different for, for a little bit in the same way that Eddie Murphy as almost a teenager on SNL, you're like, this is the most amazing comedian I've ever seen at this age. He's just so prodigiously talented at such a young age in the same way that Michael Jackson was that after Thriller. The guy's 23 years old and he's put this out. What can he do by the time he gets to 30? And in the case of all of them, what we thought was the ground floor beginning was actually the the going downhill. 
Tyson Spinks was not the beginning of the comet. We didn't catch the comet then. It was on, on the decline. He never got better than that. And he was only 21. And Eddie Murphy, it just seemed like, like poof. And SNL was making fun of him as a has-been, as a falling star when he's like 24 <laughs> or 25. Well, and David Michael Spade Jackson, almost got his ass beat over that that's one. That's right. That's right. And Michael Jackson, the moment bad came out and I'm like, oh, it's not, he's not fun anymore. It's more like he's this messianic Jesus figure for children character. He's the saintly figure than just the most amazing sort of dance music, which still like all our music, popular music is still heavily, you can't extricate Michael Jackson from Bruno Mars, Justin Timberlake, you know, on and on and on. But it, it didn't get better. He didn't get more, it changed into something else. Like by the time Bad came out, it didn't sell as well. It didn't hold the culture's fascination in the same way. And suddenly nostalgia kicks in a little bit as a bigger and bigger and bigger component about our attraction to these characters. And you still see it with Eddie Murphy now where he's 60 and it's like, Eddie's back. And it's never the same thing. Like the nostalgia factor is even bigger where you're hearing all of like Dave Chappelle or all of these huge comedians be like, oh, I grew up on him. He was so influential. He's the reason I got into it. That's like half or three quarters of the reason you're invested in some new project that comes and goes and you don't care about it. Tyson has that factor. He just soaked up something that we carry with him where maybe it's like we measure ourselves. I mean, I started doing that when I was a teenager. I was like, he's only 13 years older than me. Oh my God, this is what 30 looks like for Mike Tyson. This is what 40 looks like. This is what 50 looks like. We do that with musicians too, right? Where it's like we we measure ourselves by them in some way. They're a proxy for us. I don't know why Mike Tyson is that, but it's, I mean, he keeps saying even to Jake Paul, I made you, I created influencers. I created what you're doing. I was doing this before there was YouTube or Instagram or that kind of thing. In a way, it's true. I mean, like there's a documentary right now on Netflix about Martha Stewart. It's like, she's like, I'm the first influencer. I was Kim Kardashian before there was Kim Kardashian. I was a model and then I'm on Wall Street and then I'm um, doing a catering service. And then I become this, a lifestyle influencer on on tv and and in walmart and stuff like that tyson has some factor like this is a convicted rapist who had a children's cartoon like 10 years ago do you think bill cosby is gonna like anytime soon is like fat albert is gonna come out with a new season um after after what he did and yet at with this rate maybe 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 but tyson <laughs> anything is possible in this america Anything's possible, but if you just said on paper that Mike Tyson would be this redeemed, would be this accepted, I mean, I mean, you're maybe you're right. I mean, people are saying now we've just elected a president who's a, a multiple felon. Like, would that have been conceivable on paper five years ago, ten years ago, fifty years? Never, never. But now it now it's happened and it's normalized. So there's something about. Tyson that fix that fits into this and there's certainly something about this fight that fits into our time I think way more with way more relevancy than even like an Usyk Fury fight which I can't wait to watch the first one was amazing super dramatic I was really excited to interview Usyk for the first time I've never spoken with him I admire him a lot what he represents but I was also aware like this is what non-boxing fans are talking about. That is not moving the needle to bring casual fans over to boxing. It's certainly sating existing boxing fans, the, the base, but Jake Paul really is dragging a shit ton of audience that wants that has no interest in boxing um, through the accident of this celebrity that I bet half of the audience, half of 80 million people had never been alive watching Tyson in real time when he was relevant as a heavyweight champion, which is just, just pretty, pretty amazing to consider. Yeah. It, it's actually, especially amazing yeah. because of look like I'm 42, you're 44. We're just at the age, even at, even at our age, we're just at the age 
where we saw portions of Mike Tyson's quote unquote prime or, you know, what could be construed as something closer to it when we were kids, when we were young, like in a completely different kind of atmosphere in terms of what boxing was then, et cetera. And so, and that's us at our age, meaning that, you know, a lot of the people who are older than us and experienced Mike Tyson's career as, you know, like as adults or whatever, uh, you know, a lot of them don't recognize the sport of boxing at all and probably, you know, hear influencer or YouTuber and just fucking shut off. You know, <laughs> they fucking, they're not hearing any of that fucking bullshit. But, you know, it, it is interesting for that reason because everybody else who's tuning in who's younger is either because of Jake Paul or because of that ecosphere, atmosphere, whatever the fuck you want to call it, that has been created by the way social media ta has taken over now and being able to view old Mike Tyson fights on YouTube or ESPN classic or whatever the fuck, you know, you might see them on well, at this rate it's like reels and et cetera. So, I mean, they could be anywhere, but yeah. um, that's, that's what's really interesting about this is that it's like I said, kind of emblematic of where boxing is going. Yeah. And, and I mean, the other thing is that, like Tyson really was that good. Like, I mean, Tyson is both, I think the most overrated heavyweight ever and also the most underrated heavyweight ever in a weird way. Like that 20 year old guy was absolutely fucking phenomenal. He was, he, he was, you absolutely could, if you do the Max Kellerman thing about the four corner thing, watching Michael Jordan at his peak, watching Pele play soccer um, watching Babe Ruth hit her home run or Mike Tyson is going to fight Spinks. Nobody is going anywhere else. And they're not wrong. He was so captive. I mean, he was more a myth, more like feeding fighters to a minotaur than it was like what boxing had been before, you know, in terms of any of the great heavyweights. I love the way he was marketed by Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton. Your grandfather missed Joe Lewis or Rocky Marciano, your dad missed Ali, do not miss Mike Tyson. That was him at 18, the way he was marketed. You went in with those expectations and you came away saying, oh my God, he's so much better. When can I see him again? I don't care who he's fighting. I need to see that again. That was amazing. I can't believe I live in a generation where this guy is 20 years old. What is he going to do? And and then it was kind of gone and it became a sideshow like so quickly. It just turned after Douglas when he's still a kid, he's 23 or whatever. Um, and, and like to your point, when you're talking about age, my my oldest brother, a uh, Hungarian brother, appropriately named Attila, um, is 10 years older than me. So what the tension was for me trying to pay attention to Mike Tyson was my brother as a little kid was paying attention to the end of Muhammad Ali. And then all of a sudden the spike happens with George Foreman in 1975. And it's like, he did it. How he did the impossible. And all of these impossible things that Ali did are why his legacy is so in incredible. Uh, Tyson was not that. Tyson was never the underdog like Ali was. You know, like Rocky Marciano was a heavy underdog when he beat Joe Lewis. A old shot, beaten out of the ring Joe Lewis. That was never our relationship to Mike Tyson. It was nobody could ever beat this. Nobody in history, nobody in the future. He is the greatest ever was the feeling that he generated. Like Roy Jones did too. But Jones didn't transcend the sport in the same way, culturally. He just he just didn't. And, and it took Floyd Mayweather a long time to do that too, where Floyd became bigger than the sport for totally different reasons. Um. But yeah, so Tyson is one of those on Rushmore of, of the 20th century uh, as a kind of icon. Like I think he's sort of boxing's version of like Achilles or something, you know, a mythic, a mythic character who's very complex, the guy you cheered for, but also the guy you were scared of. Like he just represented a lot. And you were saying earlier about you know, he has a, there's a perception about him not being that intelligent or that sort of thing. His emotional intelligence, I will tell you being around him, 
probably interviewing him two, three hours in total and talking to people that have been around him. His emotional intelligence is off the charts. And you can see that not just in how he would read you if you were in the room with him, but he can, but also the way he reads this country and keeps them interested. That doesn't just happen. That doesn't just happen once. That does, certainly doesn't just happen for a sustained period. It definitely does not happen for 40 years, which is what he's doing now. As at 58 years old, 80 million people are going to watch him in a fucking boxing match against a YouTube personality. That does not just happen. And he doesn't have people doing it for him. That is the way he intuits and instinctually reads the public and keeps them interested and they can't look away. And he's continually come up with new reasons to do it. Like, like, and if you want to get a sense of how brilliant he is, when I asked him if he'd ever been molested and he gave me a look like, uh-oh, every reporter said, do not ask him this. And he gave me a look before I could type it up to publish it. He volunteered it on a radio show because he recognized its utility in rebranding himself as a victim of sexual abuse and marketing it. That's your own interviewee be. scooped you. He scooped me. He scooped me in 12 hours where I thought, oh my God, he's going to be, he can't believe he said it or he's whatever could be associated with it as a victim of it. Shame. He got ahead of the like, story, bro. He scooped you. He just was like, oh, this is brilliant. This, this will, and it made headlines around the world. And by the time I published it, who cared? Cause he'd already volunteered it on a radio show the next morning where the guys didn't even ask. They didn't ask. He just said, you know what? Maybe it's because I was sexually abused. And they went, uh, they didn't know what to say. That's how smart he is. And that is really smart because he knew it would make headlines. Why let some fucking journalist have that as a scoop when he could, he could say it on video, you know, and four or five years later, um, you know, he, he did a whole interview with it with Jeremy Schapp, you know, talking, talking about it, too. And I worked with Jeremy Schapp putting the questions together for that, for ESPN. And it was still a story because he he he's very. You can't be as as world a class of victim as Mike Tyson was as a little boy that everybody picked on and he could never stand up for himself and only his pigeons were his friends and everything. And then create the world's scariest guy as an idea that was in the real estate of all of our consciousnesses. That's all him. Like that's all his ability to get in our head. And, you know, it's, it's not unlike like a Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs didn't make anything amazing. He just knew products we'd fall in love with. Tyson can do that in his own way as an entertainer. He is a, one of the great entertainers in all of history. I think you've said this before and respectfully, you're definitely not the first person to come up with this concept. It's been, you know, decades old, if not more than a century old at this point, <clears throat> but you've also reiterated it in things that you've written. Boxing is a mirror. It, and it really is. Um, just to kind of give a few quick examples, just in case somebody hears that and goes like, huh, what? Ooh, what do you mean? If it's too philosophical for you or if it's too abstract for you, boxing is reflecting what's going on at the time in the society where it's happening, right? And that just like the technological advancements in the early 20, uh, 20th century were tremendous, and they were directly reflected in the way that boxing was, you know, operating with radio. One of the very first radio, widespread radio broadcasts, boxing match. One of the first things ever filmed on a video, boxing match. One of the first things ever dissem disseminated as a video that could be taken to theaters, boxing match. You know, moving forward, I, I talked uh, earlier about the development of television. The broadcasting of boxing matches helped develop how ads were run on TV. The TVs, the size of the TV slots, you know, the, the, the 
sport of boxing controlled a shitload of money in early TV, you know, and so forth, blah, 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 closed circuit, pay-per-view, all of these things were developed for boxing. And on top of that are the way that they were being developed and what was being broadcast at the time was directly reflecting the society, what it wanted, what it valued, et cetera. And on top of that, the kinds of fighters that it valued, the kinds of fighters it was latching onto, uh, you know, how Floyd Mayweather was the perfect star for the 2000s and 2010s. And so that being said, this fight, Tyson Paul, in that regard, people don't like it. They don't want to acknowledge it because to acknowledge it means then they have to fucking deal with it in their head, cognitive dissonance. They don't like that. They don't like having their fucking viewpoints challenged. Tyson Paul is what boxing is in 2024. That is specifically what boxing is. And again, people don't like it because that, you know, to them and to the hardcore fan, they say, no, this is you tuber. This is a circus. Hello, (laughs) put the, put, connect these, connect them. That's boxing. And and perhaps what is a little bit more difficult to figure out is that what it's always been. That's where you kind of got to get into a little bit more analysis, I think, but it is definitely what it is now. Well, I think, you know, when Rome began its decline, it's not a coincidence that the Colosseum used to have four four games a year historically four four times a year you'd get like you'd get your your top guy giving you a holiday you didn't have to go to work there was food there it's free to go it would be like a festival day where you could drink you could eat and you could be entertained and he'd give you world class entertainment whatever emperor or dictator was in power as the decline really took hold instead of dealing with what was fucked up in society Rome got to a point where half the year events were going on at the Colosseum, meaning half the year was a holiday. So the decadence of that, that just you will be entertained and the whole bread and circus thing, uh, you know, because you're right, is boxing a mirror. When Joe Lewis is standing up to Hitler's champion, America cheers for a black man for the first time collectively. Never done it before, but they had reason to do it. He stood for us in that battle and in who we were. Ali with Vietnam absolutely stands for our conflict with Joe Frey. You know, it became political. It became all of these things, a stand-in, a proxy, just like Bobby Fischer did against, you know, in 1972, fighting the Russians. It stands for the Cold War as much as going, you know, putting a man on the moon before the Russians can get there does. And you thank, always have thank God Rocky ended that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but you always you always have, I mean, boxing, unlike wrestling, which is trying to create a script, um, boxing was doing it organically, where we would find these people and find these moments and find these fights that represented us. And you're absolutely right. I mean, where Reagan's America, Tyson fit right into that. Who was promoting his fights? the man who is president of the country today and who is one of Donald Trump's most vocal supporters online, Jake Paul, Jake Paul proudly advocating that support. And I think Tyson is too, but I just mean, Mm -hmm. does does this fight fit where the country is headed um, this January with who's taking over with overwhelming majorities? Absolutely. It does. This is where that president found his base as a as a celebrity and and so yeah i think this fight for for those reasons i mean yeah okay Usyk represents ukraine at some battle over there and tyson fury is a good character and all of that it doesn't hold a candle to how relevant and emblematic a fight like this is about where we are right now so i'm not i'm not judging it but i'm saying like does it not make sense no it totally lines up and of course, it's going to get 80 million people. And to, to people outside of the United States looking at this event, does this symbolize where we are as a country? You bet. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so um, yeah, I mean, I just think about that a bit with Rome. 
Rome in its day, uh, you know, when people make that comparison to the United States really glibly, sometimes I get kind of obsessed with the particulars. And it's like, that was a society where 95% of the people lived below the poverty line and one in three people were slaves. But you could go to the fucking Coliseum and watch world-class entertainment. But, and, you, you know, know, there's probably a lot more parallels than people would be, at least from the historical standpoint, uh, you know, aware of the fact that the gladiators themselves were massive celebrities and superstars, uh, endorsed products, had their names and faces on billboards. You know, I mean, like the <laughs> the parallels are pretty fucking stark. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. And when they and when they got bored of that. Let's watch women kill each other and then let's redo battles and then let's redo naval battles. Like we need constant novelty to keep the masses entertained, to not look around at a society that is on fire. It's heating so, up. Yep. Yep. So the, you know, so I, I, I don't, it's, it's that Chinese proverb. We're in interesting times and, and we're going to watch a 58 year old guy fight a 27 year old YouTuber who was competitive, but was clearly beaten by Tommy Fury. And, you know, just to, to respond and to sell that. Out, and it's going to sell out Cowboy Stadium. And, and to respond to that, I think that uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I, I totally could be, but if I'm not mistaken, a portion of that proverb is basically the suggestion that living in interesting times is bad. Oh, it's you a curse. You don't want to live in interesting times. It's 100% a curse. <laughs> it's 100% a curse, but it's also, you know, we're, we're comparing ourselves that have, you know, been in this position for, what, 100 years, and Rome was there for 1,000. Uh, <laughs> good, good luck. <laughs> well, you know, they, they say Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, comparatively, the U.S. kind of was. So I guess it'll be destroyed in a day too, comparatively. I don't, I mean, I just, it, it's just, um, it's just weird that I'm, I'm seeing all these Xboxers, you know, Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis and people brought in to weigh in on the significance of this fight. And I, I don't, I don't really understand it like any more than the wrestling thing. Like I remember as a little kid, watching Hulk Hogan body slam Andre the Giant. And it was amazing. It was like transcendent. But I was also like, this is clearly not real. Like, why do people care about this? In a sense, right? Like, wh why are they acting as if it is real? I guess that's the thing. Like, I, I react, I can cry at a movie or I laugh or I cheer. I know it's not real. So wrestlers always say that. Like, why do people pick apart wrestling and say it's fake? Well, they don't pick it apart that it's fake. Nobody in a, you don't go watch a fictional movie and then it tells you it's actually real. That would be a problem, right? Like, like if people were dying endlessly to film and it's a snuff film, they would. Or in the rare instances where that has happened, it's been like a fucking scandal, you know? Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah, exactly. That's like one yeah. of probably the most famous example. Yeah. Yeah. A guy who said like, who was worried, the director of that was worried about people believing documentaries that they were watching were all real and not manipulated. So he made a purported documentary and you're thinking I'm describing Blair Witch. No, Blair Witch ripped off this concept from this Italian director where these guys descend on some South American um, tribe, a cannibalistic tribe and they all get murdered, the whole film crew. And that director then hid the people involved in the story as the film was released. So everybody assumed they actually were murdered. And he was tried for murdering his cast until the only way he could provide his evidence to get off was to bring the cast members to the court to, to get off. But that's, I think, the, the, the distinction with wrestling people who say, stop calling it fake, is that you're the ones who are pretending that it's real. Like if you just, it, it, there was no consequence to them admitting that it was wrestling entertainment, right? Nobody stopped watching after they said it was wrestling entertainment. So I don't know why they pretended it was real in the first place when there was no penalty. So I wonder, I bring this up, if if it turns out that, like we keep saying that as if Roy Jones and Tyson admitted that their fight was fake. They never admitted it. I've not heard anybody involved with that say it was scripted, but clearly it was. But if... If Tyson and Jake Paul just admitted 
we're going to pretend to fight and we have like an interesting script. So it's like a soap opera. Would it, it would still get a shit ton of people watching it, wouldn't it? Like you still watch Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones, not because you think any of the stunts he's doing are real. Like I you're mean, just. I think that it would, but it wouldn't get as many. It wouldn't because, get as many. Because at that's least cool. having the prospect of anything could happen is that's what's that's where the excitement is, you know? And, and that's and that's it. If you're exactly right. Blair Witch Project comes out. I think um, Cannibal Holocaust was 1979. Blair Witch Project comes out what in like the mid 90s? No, I was like 99. 99. Okay, so it comes out in 99. Or 2000 ish, something like that. Something like that. Anyway, go ahead. But even when that came out, they were blurring the lines about whether it was essentially a snuff film, that it was found footage of three people who were killed by whatever the fuck this thing was. The Blair Witch. I saw that shit in the theater, and that was still the marketing was that yeah, like, yeah, yeah. this was. And I remember being like, oh, is this that legit? Holy shit, this is fucking wild. And then, of course, you know. Even even in Vancouver, where I was when I watched that film, there were posters on telephone poles saying, have you seen the, these these kids who went out there and disappeared trying to track down the Blair Witch? So it was totally it was a hell of a marketing ploy. Yeah, brilliant. Totally brilliant. But it's exactly the same thing in blurring the lines is we're still debating whether or not this could be real. And if if Jake Paul went out there, knocked out Mike Tyson and he died in the ring. If it's like fucking Emil Griffith and 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 Benny Perret, like if that happened and he was killed in the ring, what would what would happen? Like if he's Jake not Paul would become the biggest star on the face of the fucking planet. <laughs> but he could, right? I mean, in, in a weird way, like that would get global headlines. I mean, I I wrote about that with Manny Pacquiao after he was knocked out so iconically by Marquez is so I was like, what happened if you had somebody like who was a Pacquiao level boxer get killed in the ring? What would, what would it do to the sport? Like, would it make, would it get more attention? Would it get less? It would be like, Oh, this should not happen. We should ban it. That happened after Benny Perrette. Like there was lots of talk of banning boxing. It, what would, it, it's happened time and again, though, is the thing, right? you know, it, it happened Benny Perrette. It happened, you know, even, uh, uh, fucking Davy Moore, you know, uh, 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 happened, you know, M M Mancini Kim, uh, yep. you know, B. Taven Scotland. That was, that was even in the 21st century, you know, and so it's happened time and again. It, it uh, what's his name? Uh, Magomed Abdul Salamov. We saw that shit in real time, the entire thing. Patrick yep. Day, we, we've, it's happened time and time again. So it's like, I'd like to believe I, I would, I would want to, I, in my heart, like to believe that there's something, you know, that could happen that would people would just be like, that's it, dude, take this fucking boxing shit out of my face, never fucking put it on again. And that's it. Because what the fuck are we doing? But I don't really think there is bro. <laughs> I mean, I just, we've had a uh, fucking fan man. We've had, we've had everything, dude, everything. Anything that could possibly ha a guy stormed into the fucking Dublin way in with an AK. Yeah, that's true. Everything. It's true. But what Mike Tyson is trying to lay the groundwork for is that athletes, I mean, if Michael Jordan was going to play LeBron James at one-on-one, -on -one, does that get a big audience? Does anyone want to see 60 year old Michael Jordan? I mean, Dublin? not 80 million. It no. get an audience, but not. Again, no, I, no, I get it. I get it. It's Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan playing LeBron James, playing the, the heir apparent kind of thing. But in essence, what you're trying to say is what music has done, where all of the old guys just play the fucking the hits from 50 years ago. Rolling Stones, Elton John, Billy Joel, Billy Joel selling out Madison Square Garden. It's the the residency tour and all that. But I mean, like, it's totally fine. For Billy Joel to be playing songs that he wrote 50 years ago over and over and over. We're doing the same thing now with Mike Tyson. Like there's no shelf life for an athlete in a, in a sport where you can like a thousand boxers in the 20th century died training, sparring, fighting. A thousand of them were killed being involved in the sport. Like it's, it's fucking dangerous. And now a 58-year-old guy with multiple crippling injuries <laughs> is going to find a 27-year-old guy in a sanctioned event. I, I, I'm not trying to catastrophize it, but I'm just like, 
there's a reason why you shouldn't, you know, like, like people were saying Muhammad Ali had no business fighting George Foreman when he was 32 or 33. That was reckless endangerment as far as most of the public were concerned. Look what Foreman did to Frazier. Look what he did to Norton. He's going to kill Ali with his pride. And yet, I mean, Tyson is almost twice as old as that guy fighting a, fighting a young, a young, strong strong guy who seems like it wouldn't be that difficult for him to stay out of the way or to whack a whack an easy target in the head. So if it, if it's remotely a serious thing, as all these sanctioning things are pretending that it is right. It's an, it's a sanctioned, this will go on Mike Tyson's permanent record. I just, I just don't know, man. Like, is everybody corrupt to permit this to happen? Like, what medical association could sign off on this? And if they do sign off on it, and even accidentally Tyson has a fucking stroke, I don't know. Mike Tyson will have a heart attack. Ack, 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 you want to <laughs> know by now. <laughs> oh, man. No, and I mean... Jake Paul will probably jerk off on his face after it happens. So then, then we get a nice scene. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, well, well I mean, a lot if of Logan, people might like that. If Logan Paul is going to go into a forest, the first time I heard about Logan Paul was him going into a forest notorious for Japanese suicides. Yeah. And he finds one and starts making jokes about it. So it, like, um, is, is my joke in ill taste or is this where these fucking kids are? Like, I, and I can't even remember which brother it was, but one of them got caught looting, which is like, of course, you know, if you're a Trump supporter, that's like the fucking, you just fucking committed a fucking mortal sin if you're looting. And on top of that, they're like wealthy, so I don't know why the fuck they were looting. But I mean, you know, it's these kind of absurdities, you know what I'm saying? Like in a sane world, in a just world, these are the kinds of things where like you'd be fucking shunned from society. Alas, that's your proof. This is not a sane nor just world. And also secondary proof, Tyson Paul, neither sane nor just. So <laughs> what the fuck are we doing here? I don't know. But, you know, I think it, it it's important to just kind of also say that hopefully it's been obvious this entire time that we've spoken about this, that we're not like endorsing this event and we don't love it or something like that. It's just that, you know, Somebody has to have a discussion about this that isn't just belating the fucking event and trying to get some advertising dollars off it or some shit, you know? Well, I think it's just like we were saying with if if you the idea that what the Greeks had with wrestling thousands of years ago can be turned into a multi-billion dollar business today that has no relationship whatsoever to that. Because nobody gives a shit about that globally. I mean, like, like you don't know who won any anything to do with Olympic wrestling or or amateur wrestling in the country, unless you're a very niche, siloed person that's really involved in it. Nothing wrong with it. Wrestling's fucking awesome. Like every, I, 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 but the idea that boxing is being turned into that, which it feels like it kind of is. Like the, I think the Roy Jones Tyson thing was a lot a much bigger deal than it was given credit for because it seemed scripted and nobody felt ripped off and they were paying for it. And more people paid for it than paid for the UFC or boxing. Any event that either of those two things came up with that is meaningful. That is important because boxing is not very good at most of our pay-per-views do not leave customers very satisfied with what they're getting. That's, I think that's just yep. a fact. Yep. And if Mike Tyson fighting 54-year-old, 52-year-old Roy Jones, like two guys with a combined age of 108 playing tag for three rounds, two-minute rounds or whatever it was, four rounds, um, people come away going, that was kind of nice to spend time with those guys. I miss those guys. And I always wanted to see if those guys would fight when Jones beat Ruiz and Tyson was available and, and Jones wanted $50 million to fight Tyson. That would have been really fun to watch it. We didn't see it, but this is as close as we can get. And that was kind of fun. Well, now it's free. <laughs> now with your, your fucking Netflix subscription, and it's going to get 80 million people watching it. Just tell me what the next thing is that would get remotely as many viewers is. 
because I don't know what it is. Like, as I mentioned, this is going to get more viewership than the guy who just won the presidency of the United States. From like a ancient Greek pigmachia <laughs> to modern day pig fucking ridiculous stupidity. But it's where we are. It's like it's 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 where we are. And like I, I get it, but it's um but I think it's it's fucking serious. Like I I start to think like the YouTube thing and the attention economy, it reminds me like I don't particularly like to be photographed. And that's a real sin now to be like, I don't want a family photograph. I don't want this kind of photograph. And it makes me think of Andy Warhol's thing about we'll all be famous for 15 minutes. It's we all must be famous for 15 minutes now. You're not allowed to not be on camera anymore. There's something wrong with you if you don't want this. And and Jake Paul fits that. Like for young people whose number one aspiration is to be famous rather than any accomplishment or achievement, he 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 works at like you're saying as a mirror for where young people are. He he fits. You're like, wow, he figured out how to do it. And and he worked his ass off to get there. So I give him full credit for it. But it's it's some dark shit too. Yeah. Well, and I mean prescient, perhaps, but it's like taking steroids, which he very well might be. But it's like taking steroids. You know, you don't just take steroids and then get fucking fucking jacked. You gotta put in a lot of work. You know, you don't it doesn't work like that, which is exactly why you not everybody who's taken steroids is successful because it takes a shitload of work too. Um, and similarly, you know, I don't want to reach too hard with the analogy, but Jake Paul, you know, he's put in a lot of work and the way that he's gotten to where he is, is like a steroid. It's like a fucking, you know, it's an enhanced way or whatever. It's not like starting from the bottom. It's not starting when you're a kid and working your way from the bottom. Um, and yet he's managed to get to a place that many of those people who started when they were kids and have put in a ton more work never got to. So, you know, it's, it's kind of enlightening in that regard and also somewhat sad, but showing the way perhaps. I mean, I think this, the bottom line is yeah. In, in the attention economy, if, if we're the product, as Tyson did, I mean, what would Tyson have been if Tyson was on the way up now and was an 18 year old who showed the kind of promise he did when he was 18 back in 1984, how many Instagram followers would he have? What would his YouTube channel be like? What kind of products would he be selling? Like Eris I mean, asks that shit all the time. He like, he heals like, you know, what if, you know, Cleveland Williams, just to bring up some fucking random name, you know what I mean? Like what would so-and-so be like on so in this kind of social media age like people it's would go a, nuts it's a version you know the, like you can go you can go to egypt and there's a town named alexandria why is it called alexandria because some guy fucking conquered it and slaughtered everybody there and stuck his name to it every place he was conquering or many of them he was putting his name on it same principle same same principle as this in a way is just attention history being remembered, you know, like, <laughs> and Jake Paul, Jake Paul's celebrity, just like Tyson's, like, it's incredibly shrewd to put this thing together the way they've done it. This is really smart, really, really smart. But the other thing that is interesting about it for me is the potential unintended consequences is on paper, brilliant, you're going to get a gigantic audience. If you get a gigantic audience and what you can't control is a 58 year old man has a medical emergency and doesn't recover from it. He had one on a plane sitting on a plane in first class where he needed to be evacuated from it. Then does it make any difference? I don't know if it does. Like maybe it doesn't make any difference, but, but it does make you wonder if we, if we're all looking at the same thing, which is something we don't do anymore as a culture. If we're looking at the same thing at the same time and it's fucking grotesque. It's really repellent for some reason. Like a 27 year old, maybe knocking out an old guy and, and he's convulsing on the ground. It's Mike Tyson. It's not just, some guy, like you mentioned all these fighters who got killed, but it's Mike Tyson having that. 
does that, you know, there's, there's your buyer's remorse in a, in a tidal wave potentially that lead us somewhere else. Like, like, Oh, th well, there's a drawback to getting everybody's attention. Like, I, I don't know, but I think it's possible. And if it doesn't happen here, if they've controlled the environment, you know, if it's like a shell game kind of thing, which is just a scam, it's not about chance. It's a scam. It's pretending to be about chance. If, if it's not managed well and there's a mistake, which greed, uh, you know, like any number of things could influence the unintended consequence, that's where things get really interesting, far more interesting than the scripted result, which I'm sure will be a good emotional payoff, what they've set up. But the unintended thing, you know, like, like in wrestling, when Owen Hart is lowered into the ring and he falls and dies and everybody has to say, this is not part of the show. He's actually fucking dead. It didn't stop wrestling, but it definitely changed a bit of the mood that it was fun that everything was fake. You know, like all those ambulances that were coming or hearses that were coming were funny for a while. And then suddenly it wasn't. And even the guy who came up with Candid Camera, which is about blurring the same line, there was a time he was on a plane with his wife going back to Miami and hijackers took the plane back to Havana, Cuba. And somebody recognized him and went, oh, it's a scam. It's just candid camera. We're not. And he's like, no, 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 it's not. We, these are real hijackers who've took the plane. Like, like people could die here. This is not a joke. This is not a show. We're in his world now. We're in his world where you're like, oh, I'm safe because these guys, it's a controlled experiment and, and it's going to be fun. That's, Maybe. that's where the potential for stepping over the line is. And I brought up Turkey El Sheikh earlier, and, and I will again, and this is why that's relevant, in my opinion, just like how you're bringing up with Jake Paul. Both of them have stepped into this world of boxing, and they obviously see a portion of the formula to insert themselves into this world fairly seamlessly and take from it what they want, give whatever they want, if anything, and get the fuck out whenever they want, basically. They are not immersed into this world that way not even like how we are they are not boxing people and so in that regard they can go in kind of fucking you know be a little amino acids right in the chain and then hop out whenever the fuck they want the thing is though that the whole theater of the unexpected shit dude there's shit in boxing that you cannot control and there's shit in boxing where you can't contain it like the UFC. You know, like at least not right now. Perhaps sometime in the future and with the way that the country is being governed, who the fuck knows? They're talking about getting rid of the Department of Education and all this sort of shit. Maybe they fucking take those people and make some sort of, you know, Department of Boxing. Who knows? And if that's and if that is the case, then, you know, maybe they'll pave the way to controlling boxing a lot more. But as is. There are far too many hands in the pot, far too many cooks in the kitchen. There are so many things that you can't control, and namely what happens inside the fucking ring, you know? And Turkey Al Sheikh, for instance, is finding that out with some of the bigger superstars in the sport who are like, dude, we don't, like, need you right now. Like, you know, I know you're marching in with a big su suit suitcase full of money, but, like, I got my own suitcase. Like, get the fuck out of my face. Like, at least we're not at a point yet where they where that needs to happen. And kind of similarly with Jake Paul, you know, he's has the potential for finding out. And we also have the potential for finding out that that theater of the unexpected aspect of this could really kick somebody in the ass. And just to kind of add an extra layer to that or analogy or example of that happening is other big pay-per-views that they've had where they've said those are going to be a ton of fucking uh, attention on this and blah, blah, blah. And this has happened a lot with Floyd Mayweather pay-per-views, for instance, where they put on somebody on the undercard and it's the worst fucking undercard you can possibly imagine. And it's awful. And so, oh, great. You get a bunch of attention. A ton of people watched a bunch of shit. The bunch of people watched a bunch of mismatched, stupid ass fucking things in boxing that aren't even the good things in boxing. Cool. That's what we introduced them to. And so people keep having these kinds of experiences with boxing. Um, that's also another part that you can't really control is that having all of this attention and it goes wrong in the sense that like people see a lot of the really bad parts about boxing laid bare. 
I just think it's yeah, you go to the circus and the the lion is jumping around and suddenly it bites the head off of somebody there. I I wonder how those kids feel about going back to the circus. You know, ever again or or the tightrope walker falls and misses the net. I mean it's it's just an interesting roll of the dice and in terms of the 58 year old tyson here because as i say i it's different we're mentioning all these boxers that just we didn't really know their stories when they died so much but when you put a face that's familiar you know like you know, you think about the deaths that really stop people cold. You know, when Anthony Bourdain dies and it's suicide, and you're like, wait, he has the greatest job in the world. It, It's interesting. Like when news broadcasters are crying because of that death, you're like, what? this is different. Why is this different? They talk about people dying all the time and it's completely transactional. Why is this one influencing them differently? And or like... You know, watching Muhammad Ali in in um, When We Were Kings, they never show what Ali looks like after. They talk about it. They talk about what 20-odd fights after Zaire meant. But you don't really have to deal with it. You don't really have to deal with it in the same way as seeing him. You know, he can just be this blank thing that we can project onto, as opposed to this spectacular character that was so verbal and interesting um, he he just really changes. And I don't think that movie would have been nearly as successful if you sort of saw the cost of all that bravery that he demonstrated. That it, as much as it was a blessing to help him win, it was also pathological and a curse. You know, he was completely addicted to something. It was not healthy. I think that's true of Tyson, too. I think we're Tyson is a, as addicted to us as we're addicted to him. And in both cases, it is not a healthy addiction. I think it is lethal in, in a weird way. And, and Tyson could steer us somewhere pretty fucking dark. He already has, but he could take us with something terrible happening to him. Um, because there is some weird codependency and and really unhealthy mutual infatuation. Yeah, that we I can't think. get away from him either. No. No, we, we just can't, we can't look away. And we've pretended like it's all about him. It's all, oh, he's a savage. He's an animal. He's, you know, all the weird racial stuff that was put onto him and, and stuff, you know, like, like he literally had a nickname, the tan terror when he was 18 and stuff. Like there's always been a really gross racial component to, to some of the fetishization. Yeah. To <laughs> forget when he got you know when he had uh tigers and shit and photographers were like that's the photo i need yeah him yeah. holding a tiger like, but he he was also raised by a lot of surrounded by a lot of white people too like he has his own stuff with that that is really interesting he's really obsessed with sort of white america in a, in an abstract sense that is really interesting as much as white of America is fascinated by him as the proverbial, like, like Norman Mailer said it about Sonny Liston, like, or, or he said about George Foreman, like the ultimate nightmare in, in our minds. And he was really saying white people, Good like nightmare. that was really what was insinuated. <laughs> so I think like. Mailer was so melodramatic. So, but, but I think that that, that would be what I would be most interested in is, is the falling off of the net or or the lion eating the lion tamer or just something that is not according to script happening uh that would be of like somebody said about wrestling the one emotion you never get in it is confusion that's the rarest emotion that's generated by it and that ingredient with whereas boxing shifts into wrestling shifts into scripted shifts into entertainment spectacle and we don't care we don't care if it's scripted as in the roy jones tyson thing if there is an element of confusion where like he has a stroke <laughs> or, or, or whatever whatever it is and we're like is this part of the show like in the blair witch way is this did they did they get killed doing their documentary? Like I see all these documentaries. Like this sounds just like that. Yeah, yeah. are they are they killing him for the show? Yeah. Like are are they doing this on purpose for the show? 
he literally said like i want to i think he said i want to die in the ring like i'm i would i i don't want to just die in a regular circumstance like a normal way you know i'm ready to die in the ring kind of thing like well like quite the sacrifice he would be making for the republic yeah and i mean is that ultimately what people want like i mean we've had him since he was a teenager are we ultimately waiting to get cl closure to use a fucking cliche term um and where else would be more appropriate you know like it's like who, we're who could write a better movie giving us all closure right in front of our very eyes well, I mean, it reminds me of of that that news broadcaster in Florida, uh, Sarasota, Florida, who Christine Chubbuck. Yeah, fucking shoots herself yeah. on. The, I'll give you something. If this is what you're really into, if it bleeds, it leads. Here, boom, and shoots herself in the temple and dies shortly after. I mean, for Tyson, would it would it be more surprising for him to die in the ring than what we've seen him do along the way for the last forty? Uh, almost yeah 40 years people are going to hear that and it's like it's too blunt you know what i'm saying like they they need it flowered up for them a little bit but honestly like what's what it, it's 2024 the things that we've seen and heard look dude i'm not going to get into the fucking specifics because you've had them blasted into your face and ears the last few weeks but the kind of things that you've heard the people who are about to fucking do some shit in this country say into a microphone on video, the kinds, you know, <clears throat> come on, bro. Like 30 years ago, there's, these people would have been fucking like exiled to some island or some shit, bro. And you're going to tell me that's what Bren just said, you know, is, is weird or wild or something like that. Nah, man, come on. That ain't that crazy. All I'm saying is like, like, the race car driver Senna, a legend in that sport, after he died, they made changes to make the courses safer. And nobody has died in that sport since. We're very good at when something terrible happens about making changes to deal with it. We're terrible about forecasting for the risk of danger by doing preventative measures to try to stop what could happen. We never take it seriously, ever. Like, like we're, we're just as a species, we're just not good at it. So I don't know what the Tyson thing would happen. But what I would say is if this goes totally fine is a huge success. As we're saying about the Rome Coliseum thing, we'll get bored by it. And it needs to escalate to something more dramatic, more risk. And like, that's the way it's always been with entertainment. It's never enough. It's a drug where you get a higher threshold of tolerance for it and you need more. And we're... We're not going to have those guardrails there that that it could be the start of something that is is I mean, even to say it's the start of something, it's already just so preposterous on the face of what it is um, that I yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see where it goes. And I mean, is he going to begin embarking on a tour of rematches with the the most lucrative opponents for him to fight? I don't know, but. But it's free to watch. So so here we go. They priced it right. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, it's trying to predict this is kind of dumb, you know, and it just just similar to kind of like how trying to predict Tyson Jones and stuff like that. But I guess ultimately trying to stay on the good side of my soul, if I still have it there, uh, I hope nobody gets hurt. That's it. <laughs> you know, I, I hope there's no catastrophes. I hope there's nothing wild. I hope it actually showcases good things about boxing. I hope the undercard is okay, et cetera. Like that's, I guess that's all I could do, you know, um, in a selfish way. I hope it's entertaining, I guess, but, um, you know, the potential implications, uh, for it could be bad if it did, if it went bad. So yeah, I, I hope it goes okay. Yeah, I just feel like it's 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 like like they say about NASCAR, like the biggest draw is is are you going to see somebody killed? Like I mean there's there's so an let's hope not. No. <laughs> yeah, I do and I I'm not saying it's like No, no, I, I know, but script and safe, yikes. but but the unintended consequences of them putting something like this forward could could be really interesting if something goes wrong.
with what they've planned, with what they can't control. And this is happening live. This is happening in real time. You can't control for everything. And they're, they're taking some risks with, there's a reason why 58 year olds are not doing this. Yeah, man, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty risky. So I hope that, I hope that we're able to kind of siphon some good things from it. I hope the undercard, for instance, is able to kind of rise to the top as it were, because I know there are going to be a lot of people watching, but yeah, you know, in, in that regard, I, I appreciate you singeing your soul a little bit to fucking get down and dirty with me here. No, it's fun. It's fun. It'll, it'll be interesting. I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch. I mean, you, you cannot look away. Certainly seems that way, but you know, for those who are not able to turn their heads as far as listening to this show, we, we appreciate you. Uh, you like that transition? Nah, it wasn't good. It's okay. You don't have to pretend, but we appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for listening in whatever podcast app or platform that you listen on. Go to subscribe, leave us a rating or comment. If you watched on YouTube, hi, hello, what's up? Thanks so much. Go ahead and subscribe there. Leave us a comment. Appreciate that. As far as social media goes, I'm really trying to get the fuck away from Twitter, to be honest. But, you know, I'm on Blue Sky, I guess. I mean, I'm not really plugging much of that shit these days. So, you know, if you want to find the podcast, I feel like you'll probably find it. I don't know. Bren, feel free. But Jesus Christ, Twitter's such a fucking mess these days. I think I've lost about 200 followers since since the election. It's a joke, bro. It's not because I'm posting anything political. It's just, just no. Awful. People are fleeing too. Yeah, people are fleeing. Yeah, I feel the same way. So, yeah, it's ick. It's ick. But thanks again, man. I appreciate you, and we'll talk soon, bro. You got it, man.